Real Talk by Jamaica Customs is brought to you by Jamaica Customs, keeping our customers in focus. Traveling to Jamaica with unaccompanied shipment? The Jamaica Customs Agency is encouraging all air passengers with unaccompanied shipments who have a taxpayer registration number, TRN, to present it to customs upon arrival. This will subsequently facilitate faster processing when clearing your unaccompanied shipments. The Jamaica Customs Agency will continue to implement measures to improve our service delivery and your service experience. You may contact us at 876-922-5140-8 or email public dot relations at jca.gov.jm on this and other customs related matters jamaica customs keeping our customers in focus hello and thank you for joining us for rail talk with customs the very first in the jamaica customs agency's podcast series it's a platform to respond to your quest for information and to further explain the customs processes i'm damian mitchell today embracing the data culture what customs has got to do with it? On Real Talk with Customs today, we have three gentlemen, all with the deeds. Marlon Lowe is the Deputy CEO of Operations, Andre Williams, the Chief Information Officer, Digital Transformation, and Earl Stewart, the Director of Planning and Research. Gentlemen, even before delving into the data and customs, let's start at the very beginning. Marlon, what is the role of the Jamaica Customs Agency? Damien, our role are wound up in our mandates, and there are three of them, trade facilitation, border protection, and of course, the collection of revenue, and in no particular order, <laughs> there's, a, there's a balance that we have to do with these three mandates. We have to ensure that the society is protected, and there's a core function there, and we have to ensure that we can pay our nurses and teachers, but very important to custom is trade facilitation, which is to ensure that there is good customer service and our services, our customers are satisfied and that we are contributing positively to the economy. But customs and data, Marlon, is there really a relationship? Big relationship, Damien. Um, we use data in a lot of ways, apart from strategizing for our customers. We use data you know, our everyday work and technology through non-intrusive inspection, risk management, to make it easier for our customers in terms of e-payment and stuff like that. So there's a lot of data and a lot of work that is done at the operational and strategic level. And of course, Andre and Earl can tell you more about that. Well, certainly <laughs> we'll come to some of those issues, including e-payment. But Andre, ultimately, all you do here at the Jamaica Customs Agency really should be to improve the customer experience. How has technology been helping? Right, so we do have a lot of services that are public facing and um, in terms of the timeliness, the ease of access and the convenience. Uh, what we really have been doing is using technology to reshape how we interact with our customers and certainly the respective partners within the logistics and supply chain. And uh, so what we have done is to improve on the services that are available, moving from semi-automated to fully automated and now to digitalized uh, services to allow for clients to submit what is needed to carry out their respective um, activities with customs, whether it is import, transit, or export related activities. Uh, time is a big factor when it comes to trade and in terms of cost reduction, cost in terms of logistics. Uh, moving to and fro between customs and other government offices, which is pretty much um, eliminated in most instances, and we're working to ensure that we have a full digital service and interaction with all our stakeholders. So what does a semi-automated service look like compared with an, a fully automated service? Right. So fully automated service speaks to an online um, environment where you can uh, go ahead, complete a registration for use of the service, uh, complete an application, submit the supporting documents, make payment, and of course, an electronic workflow, which is a case within customs for the all our co uh, transactions, commercial and non-commercial, and of course, obtaining the approval and thereafter go being able to go to the port and uh, clear your goods. Um, so um, we also have uh, the activities which will correspond or will need for other government agencies to play a role as well. Uh, currently, we have um, 16 government agencies who have built out services for within our Ascuda World System. And as you can imagine, that has improved um, how we interact with the government agencies, how the clients interact with them um, towards um, a very user-friendly environment um, for reduced time. 
Well, let me move now then to the two other flagship, the Asicuda World and the Jamaica Single Window for Free Trade. That's J Swift. I want to home in on those, but Marlon, uh, before we move to Earl, uh, which applies to the importer buying, let's say, two mats from Amazon versus the one who is importing a whole fleet of cars? Asicuda, J Swift. Um, depend on the price, of course, that they pay for the two mats, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, Asicuda will be relevant to both um, in terms of the fleet of cars, certainly J Swift and Asicuda, but at different stages. You have to first of all apply to J Swift to get the permit. That will go to a third party, say, trade board for approval. Information is fed back in J Swift, and when you're ready to clear customs, then the information would have been in our custom system. Bringing in two marks, um, you don't necessarily need to have to do anything with J Swift. It's just a secure at that point, unless there is some regulator body that you need to satisfy some requirements. That, that is where you might need to use J Swift because it is for all the border agencies, while a secure is really between customs and the customer. Earl Stewart. Director of Planning and Research. Damon. Are you finding that there's a difference in how people are embracing technology in respect of engaging customs? Uh, most certainly. Uh, I think the general public, our clients, our customers are way more appreciative of the services that we are putting out there. Um, I recall uh, back in the days coming to customs house here. Um, you'll see a lot of brokers, a lot of our broker clerks hanging out out the front waiting to find, you know, is my declaration ready? Or back then they call it an entry. Now I think, you know, they appreciate the fact that, you know, they can stay at their place of business or just about anywhere they are in the world and do business with customs. I mean, that's cost saving, if you ask me. Yes, and there's a time is money. Exactly. Yes. But there really does seem to be a gap, though, Earl, between mm -hmm. all you're providing with, with, with your systems and your technology mm -hmm. and people's level of satisfaction with the customs. Where is that gap? Uh, so we conduct annually our customer service survey, um, you know, looking both from our commercial and our non-commercial importers. And to be honest with you, what the data is saying to us in terms of the service that is provided by customs. The issues persons have with customs, you know, to some extent is not necessarily a customs issue. So persons will com complain about the tax rates that they are paying and such forth. That's really not a customs issue, per like se, the, right? Like the $50 like, exactly. limit and stuff. <laughs> for, for, for um, duty-free imports. <laughs> and then being transparent, persons will talk about the valuation issue and such forth. But um, you would have seen we have a campaign going on right now where we're promoting and encouraging persons to be very um, transparent with customs, re proper declaration of invoices. And it's for those reasons why you know, we find that that is the main issue that comes about when you talk about the services of customs. But in terms of efficiency, not at all. I mean, we're averaging now 90% of commercial declarations processed within 20 hours or charter standard time. Wow. If I might add to that, though, Damien, there sure. is an issue of persons not understanding the difference between customs and other entities in the trading environment. And all we try to solve that is to work with those entities like the ports and so on, so that persons can know that distinction. And of course, the PR that Earl uh, speak right. about. Well, I was just coming to the issue that we may need a whole program to talk about <laughs> assessing imports for customs duties. But how are you, or how are your systems helping to make it easier for people to understand how you arrive at your figures that they need to pay in duties? We do a lot of, now you'll realize um, we are doing a lot of PR, um, if that's the correct word, advertisement mm -hmm. and the radio and so on, time signal and so on, and that is helping. But we also do a lot of what we call town hall type mm -hmm. meetings and so on that we get specific interest group and try to explain particular areas of custom with them. The, the system actually has the rates incorporated in it. And um, we, we are about to launch our new website, for example, and you'll have a duty calculator on it to mm -hmm. help the customer um, with that. Uh, Mr. Williams can speak more to that, but that is 
part of the website when it is relaunched. Well, let's have Mr. Williams speak yes. more about that. What are some of the systems in the pipeline? Since it's just the four of us here, you probably all right. well, tell it's us quite a bit, it. but I'll give you the main ones. <laughs> um, so, as Mr. Lo mentioned, uh, we are to be launching our new website, and um, one of the key features, of course, it has to do with the duty calculator, which will uh, give persons a proper estimate or the actual calculation of the duties that they can anticipate to pay on one or multiple items. Um, we also will be having a track and trace service as well, so persons will have the visibility to see exactly where their transaction is, uh, whether it is with a, a particular person within the logistics supply chain or within customs itself. So we'll provide that information as a service. Uh, we are also going to be introducing some additional payment uh, features, which will make it easy for just about anyone who has a uh, transaction with customs, for example, someone um, in Hanover who has a barrel that is being picked up and of course the freight forwarder is acting on their behalf. If they decide to pay, they should be able to go on our portal and complete that payment. Um, we're also going to be changing how we deal with um, overtime goods, goods that are left at the port and are now subjected to auction. Uh, we'll be introducing a new online auction feature, which is new. So currently we conduct auctions in face-to-face. Um, that will be a thing of the past. We will now have the items being listed, and of course, some uh, persons who are interested can register and participate actively. And that, of course, will be open to any member of the public once they complete the registration and satisfy the requirements. They'll be able to participate. And the photos of these items? Photos, details, uh, competitive bidding, and of course, a su successful uh, bidder will be able to complete payment and will simply come and pick up the goods. So wow. that's the job. Right. And, and before you, Earl, what timeline are we looking for? Uh, we're to? trying to bring this on um, for the uh, new financial year. So we're looking in between March and April. Both of this year? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Damon, I want to tie in what Andre has mentioned regarding the new systems and what Mr. Lowe mentioned in terms of how our systems are helping. And just to bring the conversation to data to say that, you know, through the data, we are indeed listening to our clients and our customers. So we would have our customer feedback form, um, our CC8 application, which is our CRM, that you know, allows persons, the, the public, to pretty much um, submit their queries, their concerns, their complaints. And what we do, we go through and we disaggregate this data, because data is both quantitative and qualitative. So we look at this data to see what are the issues that are coming out, out of um, the complaints, the queries, the and sometimes the commendations, of course, and so forth. And we also conduct surveys. And you know, as I mentioned, annually, we look at what, what is it our clients are saying to us. So our clients would have echoed um, particular new services, including the Queen's Warehouse services. Um, you know, because as we move into the digital space, you're finding that especially the, the younger generation, <laughs> they're moving away from the face-to-face -face and the need to travel to that place. Why can't I do it online? And mm -hmm. Customs is responding in that regard. Yeah. Right. Well, before we move the discussion from your new systems which are coming on board, I want to ask the question though, Andre, mm -hmm. will you have a system that can make it easier to dispute the $60,000 that is being imposed <laughs> for importing a few appliances versus the $3 million in duties for my mm -hmm. fleet of cars? Yes, right. So interestingly, we will also be introducing another new service. It is our appeals uh, module, which um, allows for customers if they're dissatisfied with a particular transaction um, that they can uh, through an online service, um, apply uh, to the commissioner. So in other words, they could raise an appeal and enter the details. And that, of course, will also have an electronic workflow within customs to ensure that we can respond in a timely manner, that the matter can be looked into. And of course, if further details are required, whether it is internally or from the importer, that can be had. And of course, we respond in um, a relatively short period of time. So we're going to be setting some SLAs for those. And, um, SLAs? Uh, service level agreements in terms of how quickly we respond. And of course, um, to ensure that the matter is brought to a reasonable conclusion. Damien, just to say though, that what Andre just explained is the automation of a process. We yes. already have an appeal appeal process um, right. that process can use if they are dissatisfied um, with a decision. Yes. Well, Earl, you may agree that the pandemic has, in more ways than one, <laughs> changed how customs operate. Uh, would you say out of evil comes for good? Um, <laughs> depends on how you look at evil, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just as look. Uh, but definitely, I, I would say that the agency has leveraged the opportunity mm -hmm. um, afforded through COVID-19. I know a lot of you know, persons think about COVID-19. I mean, all of us, we go to the negative. Huh? But, you know, 
we're an entity that seeks to, for in everything, looks in every risk, let me use that term, we looked mm -hmm. at the opportunity that arises from it. And we have done so, utilizing um, technology. Andrea has mentioned it. Um, I can recall us moving a number of our appointments to utilizing the Microsoft Teams platform. Um, we have introduced, so persons, for example, persons no longer need to come down to the valuation unit for an appointment, for an interview. All of that, uh, you stay home and get that done. The, re the return in residence <laughs> right. um, section, the interview is done online, the processing is done online. So we're, you know, and the truth is, if I may say this, there were some systems that we were pushing that there was resistance. And I saw resistance um, decreasing over the period of COVID and persons more embracing utilization of the technology. So I guess out of evil comes for good. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to see, Andrew. Yeah, I just want to add that um, it really has been um, much easier for us. We have had much more buy-in from the respective stakeholder groups, the custom brokers, the freight forwarders, other government agencies. Uh, we were able to operate and, and um, even in improving on our efficiencies during the COVID time. So we were, we were pretty much undisturbed during that period, mm -hmm. not just customs. And again, we mentioned our other partners, the other government agencies who have been using our services to carry out their documentary review and inspection. So that pretty much was uninterrupted during that period. And one could only imagine what would be the opposite of that if we had not moved an, um, mm -hmm. into an online space. And this has always been a part of our strategic objectives. We have a lot of other programs to mm -hmm. come online. Uh, this just simply accelerated it. It gave us the opportunity to bring persons on board in a much shorter turnaround time. I'm sure Earl spoke about the issue of return to residence and the processes and systems which are now in existence for them. Mm -hmm. But Marlon, can you say whether there is greater embracing of that sector of your customer base, the return to residence in engaging your digital platforms? Certainly, they have been using the, the new approach in terms of they going online or their brokers on their behalf and applying to customs. So there's no, before they man, should you come to customs head office, you'll see a lot of persons just waiting to get an interview, right? No, nobody needs to wait. And why is that right? interview necessary? To help to determine your status um, in terms of returning residents, what benefit you entitled to, you're entitled to. All of that now has been pushed online. So you apply, you can even apply before you <laughs> come to Jamaica, right? <laughs> right? right. And, and you can get your status before you come to Jamaica. And of course, um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the various um, embassies and so on overseas help with that communication as well. So, so we have got full embracement of that, embracement of that. Service. Very well. Mm -hmm. But Andre, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. the customs agency has a role to protect the government's coffers. Yes. How are your systems seeking to capture those who seek to exploit <laughs> for their own selfish gains? So apart from the... In other words, how are, you, how are your systems <laughs> trying to catch the cheats? Good. So <laughs> apart from the trade facilitative um, aspects of things, of course, um, water protection um, is mm -hmm. also another key component. Um, the data allows for us to carry out active real-time risk management, um, not just for customs, but for all our partnering government agencies. And so what we have is a tremendous amount of data which allows us to do analysis, allows us to set criteria to identify non-compliant traders, non-compliant suppliers, mm. um, products that might be of, of interest uh, to us and to other government agencies. So uh, in the automated space, uh, we are now able to establish uh, quite a bit more um, that would not have been um, as efficient in a manual paradigm. So we have been doing a much better job um, coordinating inspections, reducing overlaps between customs and other government agencies. Mm -hmm. So risk management is a huge component in what we're doing, both for cargo and for, of course, passenger processing as well, and it allows us to do our job much better. And how do you measure your success in that <laughs> realm? Is that well, where Earl comes in? Well, he can, <laughs> yeah, he will come in, but um, certainly time, time is one of our mm -hmm big performance indicators. Convenience is also mm. one, and reduction in costs. Um, customs, for example, uh, would have removed, I'll give you an example, six documents, six primary documents. That's a saving of $180 million per year, which would have been an expense to importers in buying these forms, completing them, and submitting them. That's no zero. That's no longer the bill. Moving between offices, um, that is no longer necessary, right? Um, so 
time costs and conveniences are some of the three Earl, mm -hmm. No, so for every business unit within the JCA, we establish uh, performance indicators and stuff, every single, right, based on our processes and our services that we offer. And outside of that, we have um, 15 key performance indicators that we monitor on a monthly basis and such forth, um, and presentation on them and looking at what is happening, why this performance, why not this performance, why are we not achieving the target versus and stuff. I mean, so far we're, we're hitting most of our targets, uh, but we, we use the data, you know, we mine the data, we, we analyze the data, we interpolate from the data um, to guide our decision making into, you know, how we are performing. So we don't take for granted that just because we have implemented a, a new system, that we have solved the problem. We then now need to monitor to see whether or not this new system is offering the level of service that is expected or desired. Mm -hmm. If I might just add to that, though, sure. we actually have a published citizens charter in terms of time and mm -hmm. so on, and we are held to that by the public, <laughs> by yes. the broker community yeah. and so on, yeah. right? So we have to deliver within a certain time frame in terms mm -hmm. of most of our services. Yeah. Well, we've mm -hmm. heard from Andre that the new website is coming. But is there anything more you can tell the customers they should be looking out for, both your commercial and your non-commercial customers? I think it will be safe to say that um, we will be coming out with a customs app. Yeah. Um, a customs app? Right, <laughs> yes. Um, not at the beginning of the financial year, but certainly we should have that uh, sometime this year, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And that will help to change the environment. We also will be looking at enabling the small man more to be able to send declarations to mm -hmm. customs and communicate with customs. Mr. Williams speak about payment means, for example, logging in your bank account, for example, and be, being able to pay for a declaration, um, that as well. So, um, the, so pay directly from your bank account right, to customs. Right. right. So those are things that we are looking at, and those things will help to change the, land, the landscape. Interesting. Yes. Mr. Williams, you have to tell us a little bit more about the <laughs> customs app. I'm sure right, everybody's so, interested about sure, it. Sure, definitely. Um, as you really mentioned, uh, there's a demand for um, increased convenience, and mobile apps allow for, of course, um, information and services to be at your fingertip. Um, so we're, we're prioritizing um, our key services, of course, online payment, um, track and trace, by way of info and of course, information as a service. So those are three of the key services that we're going to be introducing in the mobile app. And there are long so list. That's track and trace. Track and trace, mm -hmm. right. Um, the payment, online payment, you'll be able to register using the mobile app and make payments. And of course, um, information in terms of the different services and processes, uh, what it entails. Um, so those are, that's just a starting point we do have, and that will be a continuous development in, and inclusion of additional services. But as Mr. Lord mentioned too as well, um, partnership with other uh, private sector entities being for customs to be listed as a merchant, just like how you are paying a JPS bill or an NWC bill, right. we also want you to have the ability to pay for your customs charges there, so you'll be able to enroll and to look up your, um, retrieve your declaration and make that payment. Um, so those are some key changes um, that we're going to be introducing. All on an app? Well, app and more in terms of um, integration with other services. Very well. So Earl, how is data and, and research really, though, helping to influence these changes that the customs department is cons customs agency is, is considering? Well, you know, we have a strategic outlook in terms of developing a data-driven culture here at the JCA. And if I say that right now, we don't have a data-driven culture, I I'll be wrong and such forth. So it's more enhancing it and so forth. And one of the things we have done in, from the standpoint of capacity development, we started by um, you know, providing training in applied research to our officers and such forth. So now within the JCA, an officer uh, at least three times for the year, we offer applied research where we're teaching about um, did I just say teach it? <laughs> We're trading about, uh, um, f you know, utilizing particular research methods, you know, in, in, in how you, you go about to look into things. And we find that the staff here has been very receptive to it. Um, you know, every court we have over 25 and so forth. Sometimes we have to, you know, shed some mm -hmm. and stuff for it. But um, we're doing that. And we're, we're utilizing applied research 
you know, to, to guide the decision making that we're so no in customs we're not making decisions or implementing new measures out of feeling and out of Earl's past experience, but we're utilizing the data, you know, what is the data saying, what is it we're interpreting um, um, from the data. And you know, within the varying quarters, I mean Marlon, Andre would have mentioned risk management, but we also have post clearance audit that you know, they utilize a lot of data in terms of doing the post assessments. Um, we have our revenue analyst, and you know, just in various quarters. Where would we want to reach? To be honest, I'd want to reach a point where you know, every single line officer mm -hmm. is utilizing data in, in, in their day-to-day -day activity. So for example, for me, an officer is going out there to do an inspection on a shipment. I want to reach a point where um, that officer, and we have the capability now, but you know, we want to reach that level where the culture is concerned, where the officer sees the needs to you know, pull up a file, you know, look back on the history of the, of the client before you know, going to do an examination, because that can help with the level of efficiency and such forth. I mean, if I pull up Damien and I see that Damien is compliant, then there's no need for me to be doing a you know, rigid and thorough inspection and such forth. Whereas if I looked at the history and I see, okay, you know, there are Marlon. particular, <laughs> oh, <Marlon. laughs> there are particular issues with Marlon, then it says to me, you know, I might have to be keen and be more vigilant, you know, I'm doing this thing and such forth. And mm -hmm. all of that would add to the customer's experience. Right. So. Now, I, ha I have to come back to this issue though, Marlon, because there's generally the feeling that there may be some skewing towards the commercial versus the non-commercial importer in respect of the attention that they get from the Jamaica Customs Agency. Wow. Can you address that? That is certainly not so. Let me say that first of all. In yes. fact, most of our resources, a lot of it, is focused on the non-commercial importers mm -hmm. because in, in terms of the numbers, mm -hmm. they, are, they are greater, uh, maybe less in terms of contribution of revenue mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But there are programs that our commercial importers make use of, for example, our authorized economic operator program, AEO, that we go through a system of validation and so on. So we don't have to examine most of the shipment because there is a supply chain security assessment that is done from overseas right onto the container is in Jamaica. There is a um, site assessment that would go to some of the company's premises and do the examination but it's difficult to apply these to the non-commercial. So you'll find that a lot of our examinations focus on the non-commercial, um, as I say, less revenue, but much more. There yes. are twice the number of declarations that are done for the year in terms of non-commercial commercial. versus That's commercial. Right. Not in value, but in, in terms of just the, the volume, the numbers. number. Mm -hmm. So if you should go on the port, for example, and see our custom officers, a lot of that attention is on non-commercial importers. But I want to say this, the customs up that we're talking about and stuff like that, ease of payment, those are also focused on yeah. our non-commercial importers. Yeah. So we are looking to make, make it easier for them. And well. to be fair, what's there then for the commercial importers? We already have a lot of programs, as I said, AEO program, and we have about a, we have about a third. What's the AEO? Authorized Economic Operator. That's a WCO, World Customs Organization, certified program that we do an assessment. For example, your company, and we deem that you are compliant, you have all the necessary things in place regarding your staff, your security, everything. And so there, there is some amount of comfort in using risk management and not examining 100% of your containers all the time. So you benefit from that. Uh, we have our site inspection program where we allow the container to go to your premises if we need to examine it and we'll come to your premises to do the examination. In terms of e-payment, most of that is our commercial importers that benefit from that. So there are a lot of programs in place for our commercial importers. Yeah. Really. Very well. We're almost at the end of the discussion. Time sure flies when you're talking customs. Yeah. But I want to go to Earl as we mm -hmm. take the round robin. The big picture. What's mm -hmm. your grand expectation of Jamaica Customs in the next five years? Next five years. Uh, more digitalization, mm -hmm. um, more online services, um, greater efficiency and effectiveness, um, even on the border protection side. Um, in terms of you know what we're doing with the non-intrusive inspection program, uh, 
having greater detection, and at the end of the day, just delivering a satisfying customer experience to the public. Andre? Um, as I mentioned, um, certainly digitalization is our key objective. We, we will establish ourselves as a digital customs authority within the region. Um, inclusiveness in terms of uh, partnership with public and private um, sector stakeholders and ensuring that we are meeting and exceeding the needs. So certainly technology is one of uh, the enablers, but certainly bringing on that culture, right, that mm -hmm. will allow for us to optimize all our processes, right? That mm -hmm. requires quite a bit of coordination and the ultimate, of course, and most important, being customer-centric, looking at the needs of our clients and how we can improve it. Marlon, what's your sight of the big picture of the Jamaica Customs Agency in the next five years? Damien, I would say efficiency, technology is a means, not an end. So it is a means to the end. So I would say efficiency, efficiency, and efficiency, using technology as a driving wheel for that efficiency. Well, thank you so very much. And gentlemen, that's all the time we have for today's program. This has been Real Talk with Customs, the first in a series of podcasts of the Jamaica Customs Agency. You just heard from Marlon Lowe, the Deputy CEO Operations here at the Jamaica Customs. We also had Andre Williams, the Chief Information Officer, Digital Transformation, and Earl Stewart, Director of Planning and Research. I'm Damian Mitchell. Bye for now. Traveling to Jamaica with unaccompanied shipment? The Jamaica Customs Agency is encouraging all air passengers with unaccompanied shipments who have a taxpayer registration number, TRN, to present it to customs upon arrival. This will subsequently facilitate faster processing when clearing your unaccompanied shipments. The Jamaica Customs Agency will continue to implement measures to improve our service delivery and your service experience. You may contact us at 876-922-5140 to 8 or email public dot relations at jca.gov.jm on this and other customs related matters jamaica customs keeping our customers in focus real talk by jamaica customs is brought to you by jamaica customs keeping our customers in focus